my name is Sarah English and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how I create my YouTube videos because there's been a couple of people on the Kanban listserv that have been interested to know how I have done what I have done so yeah thought I'd share that with you first things first a little disclaimer here to me choosing to flip your classroom is an extremely personal choice and I know many of you because of this pandemic have been thrown into this situation where all of a sudden you are being asked to produce videos. I get that. But if you're really looking to the future and thinking about making your own videos and investing in a lot of time, you have to think deeply about taking this venture on because it can be a little time consuming, just, just, just a little. So a couple of key things before you start this whole process, because let's think for a moment that we are talking about a venture that you're going into that is beyond just our current situation. So I want you to think about your school and I want you to think about what your school technology profile is like. How prepared is your school for you to come back and start teaching again, but using videos outside of the classroom instead of lecturing in the classroom. So does your school have a learning management system that can support and house your videos? Will you have IT support, which I can't stress how important it is to have a relatively decent relationship with your IT department at your school? as you go into this process because you might have some questions for them. Uh, also think about equity and access, which is a big hot topic right now and will continue to be a hot topic in the future. So you need to really consider your student population and what they have available if you suddenly decide to take this flipping concept very seriously. Also think about what is your bandwidth at school? Can it support having your entire class watching a video at the same time. If you're doing an in-flip or if you're absent and you're asking your students to watch one of your videos while you're out of school, or if you have students who are done for the day in class for what you're asking them to do and they start watching videos in your class. Also, do the majority of your students have Wi-Fi at home? The way I gauge this is I ask my students at the beginning of the year, if I asked you to, could you watch a video on YouTube of a cat getting scared by a cucumber? And if they respond back, yes, yes, Dr. English, I can. Okay, there's a really high probability that they probably can watch one of my videos as well. And finally, do your students have access to devices? Like I can talk from personal experience that the students at my school, at Sweet Home High School, have had iPads for a very long time and it is very much a part of our culture. So does the students that you're asking to watch videos, do they have cell phones? Do they have iPads or tablets? Do they have a way of watching your videos outside of school? So before you invest a ton of time in this whole process, you have to think about what basics do you have to make this a reality? Let's talk for a second about the current reality of flipping in 2020 as we are in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, you're at home, you're trying to get something done, you're thinking about the future, but you wanna start flipping right now. So what do you have to work with, with shooting your videos? Uh, do you have a laptop or maybe a desktop or some type of tablet? Because what you have really determines like what type of software you're going to be able to use and what other things you can do with it. Think about the location of where you're going to film. Right now, I'm at my home office. There's a high probability that a small child could come through that door right there and pretty much ruin everything that I'm currently doing. I have to think about lighting. At school, and I typically shoot my videos at school in my classroom, the light is perfect. I have the projection screen pulled down in my classroom. It's not a nice matte finish. It's consistent over time. It's not busy. The lighting is the same throughout. Here my location is my office, which is very, very busy for me in the background. And there's one central light that's coming down from the center of the room, which is, I think, giving me a little bit of a halo effect. 
which is not cool. So you really want to think about lighting, especially if you're going to do this uh, more in the future. Then you have to think about sound. Really, sound is a make or break for a lot of videos. Uh, and I'll talk about the, the sound that I'm using uh, right now. But when you listen to a YouTube video and you decide whether or not you like watching that YouTube video, a lot of that will come down to are they using the sound from just that they can capture from their computer or are they using some type of external microphone? And then finally, what's your financial situation? Because if you want to do this right, there's a lot of great free apps that are out there but you can make it a lot better if you have a little bit of money to play with. And I'm already thinking right now, school districts are not going to have a lot of money in the future, at least in the near future, to throw at getting people a whole bunch of equipment or site licenses to buy things to flip people's classroom. So the takeaway right now as you're watching this video and I talk about what I'm using to actually shoot my videos, is that you really might be forced into do what I call a quick and dirty video right now, but learn from the experiences that you're having in the hopes that in the future you might be able to produce something more polished. So quick and dirty versus one and done videos. The videos that I have on my YouTube channel are definitely one and done videos. I have done an, a lot of investment into how I have made my videos and I've really thought about the following questions when I started back in 2014 and 2015. So before you commit, personal questions and suggestions. Do you plan on making the video every year and updating it based on how you're feeling? Or are you looking at making these videos and thinking, okay, this is one and done and me from 2015 is now going to be currently teaching my students from 2020. Next, are you going to use free software and there's a lot of really good free software that's out there right now? Or are you going to invest some money into this whole experience? And then finally, and probably the most critical question, what do you want to be able to do in your video? This is really, really important. And I think it requires some thought on your part on what you want to be able to accomplish in your videos and what's the purpose of your videos. So I can't stress it enough how important it is that you do some research and make choices before you start filming. So find your inspiration. Look over a whole bunch of YouTube videos. Personally, mine was a 2010 YouTube video by Paul Anderson entitled How to Make an Educational Screencast for Mac. And I really sat down and watched this nine minute and 59 second video about what he was doing to make his videos. I'd also watch some other YouTubers that you see out there that are shooting educational videos and, and not the high end people, not the people that are throwing a ton of time and energy into uh, doing animations. And you, you look at it and you think, wow, somebody's really making, putting some time to this. No, I'm talking about other teachers, what they're doing and what you like. What do you like and what do you dislike? And then what are you willing to invest in terms of time and money? I'm not going to lie. I started in 2014 with shooting my videos. It wasn't until 2019 that I got those videos done. So roughly around five years to flip my entire region's chemistry class with a little bit of smattering of AP chemistry in there as well. So this was not something I did in one year. How do I make my videos? Uh, the hardware. I have a MacBook Air laptop and my school gave that to me. So every teacher in my school pretty much, at least nine through 12, has a MacBook Air that has been issued by my school. Yes, I know I am very, very, very lucky. The next thing that I use is a blue Snowball USB microphone. I do not like the microphones that hook up on your clothing because that would just be a nightmare. I'm waving my hands around too much and I would hit the microphone. So not a good choice. I also use a Wacom Intuos Pro tablet. Now this particular version of my tablet, which I'm writing on right now, I bought this back in 2014. 
it's still working great. The drivers still update, it's functioning beautifully. So this was a hefty investment, like 200 plus dollars, but I have never regretted uh, having this tablet because I absolutely wanted to be able to write clearly and neatly on my screen. That was really, really important to me. So I'm not doing this on an iPad. I am not doing this on a Chromebook. I am absolutely uh, filming this off of my MacBook Air. The camera that I'm just using is through my computer and it works out just fine. It definitely does what I need it to do. All right, let's talk software. I am using Keynote for Mac to organize all of my content that appears on my slides. It's basically, like I've said, Apple's version of PowerPoint or Google Slides. I love Keynote. Keynote makes me so incredibly happy. I cannot imagine my world without Keynote. It's a thing. I love it. Now, this little piece of software was absolutely critical. So this is ink to go And if anybody can find a similar type of annotation software, I'm all ears and I'd like to hear about it. I love ink to go um, I have some issues with it every once in a while. But basically what this is, it's a screen annotation tool. And it can screencast as well. And basically what ink to go does is it allows my tablet to talk to my computer. It took me about a month to find ink to go I went through Omnidazzle. I went through a whole bunch of screen annotation software that I really didn't like, but ink to go absolutely serves its purpose. Uh, but finding this thing and then getting it to work took a long time for me. And then finally, the screen capture software that I use is, it's by a company called TechSmith and it's called Camtasia. And yes, it costs some bank. There's a lot of great screen capture software out there that's free, but I wanted something high end. I wanted to be able to cut out small pieces of video. I wanted to get rid of all the so's, ah's, ums, and just dumb mistakes that I made easily. So Camtasia, has been and will continue to be the, in my world, like the Cadillac of all screen capture software. I can't imagine my life without it. So how do I make my videos? Step one is converting my student notes into keynote slides. This can take a while. So it's do not underestimate the amount of time that it can take. Step two is thinking about what I'm going to say and having a mental script so important because nobody likes a babbler. Nobody. Be purposeful about what you are going to say and then just say it. Don't go into random examples or it can double the amount of time that you spend shooting a video. Then I talk through the slides before filming because that really brings a lot of problems out into the front or makes me pause and think and ask myself, do I really want to say that? Or is that really correct? And then I go back and I check a whole bunch of stuff. It also makes me look and make sure that everything makes sense. And then I also ask myself, do I need to bring in other images like reference tables or other things that can help make what I'm saying more clear? And then finally, what is my time frame? How long is this taking to shoot? If it's taking more than 10 minutes, I have problems. Now given sometimes a certain topic might take 12 or 14 minutes. But under normal circumstances, I'm trying to stop around 10 minutes. Next step is to actually shoot the video. A 10 minute video might take me 30 minutes to shoot just based on how much I screw up. And then I got to edit the video. This is always fun. This takes a while because I screw up a lot. Again, a, a 10 minute video at the end might take an hour and a half to edit, depending on how dumb I am. And then finally, I know this says publish to YouTube, but really what I do is I publish to a local file first, and then I will upload it to YouTube once I've gone through, checked a couple of things, put on my title slide, and, and I feel more comfortable about what I'm doing. And then I repeat steps one through six until I have all the sections that make up a particular unit in chemistry done. So that's a not so brief overview about how I shoot my videos. And if you have more specific questions, please feel free to contact me at the email below. Have a great day.